Well, happy uh, Wednesday evening. You made it. This is the last chapter in the book. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Gary, uh, ham radio call sign Whiskey for Echo Echo Yankee. Uh, and this is a beginning ham radio class, but actually the last uh, instructional class in the series. Uh, but uh, if you've uh, joined us tonight for the first time, well, Go back and take a look in the playlist and you can find all of the other classes and you too can get your ham radio license. A ham radio is alive and well and I say it's the best hobby in the world because it's a worldwide hobby. You, know, you get to uh, communicate with other hams all around the world uh, directly from your own station uh, that you put together that you assemble and, and get on the air. So it's kind of fun. Uh, this is the book we use. I always like to show it. Uh, it's the American Radio Relay League uh, License Manual. This is the fifth edition. Uh, it has the most recent question pool. You get your ham radio license by passing a 35 question uh, multiple choice test. And you have to get 74% right and uh, then you get started. And of course, we always recommend uh, joining a local ham radio club and having other folks there uh, help you get on the air and uh, just uh, hearing your call sign come back to you for the first time. That's really exciting. So tonight we're going to be talking about chapter nine in the book, which is the last chapter, but maybe it should be the first chapter. Uh, it's about safety. Uh, and uh, safety is an, uh, something that we have to be aware of uh, in the hobby. Uh, and uh, then uh, after we get through the five sections uh, of this chapter, then we'll take a, a five minute break and we'll come back and together as a group, uh, individually, of course, with yourself, uh, we'll take a practice test. We'll go through all 35 questions and then uh, review and find out which were the, the correct answers. And uh, then you can grade your own paper. You don't have to share your score with anyone else uh, and see how you're doing. And uh, hopefully uh, you're doing great. Uh, it's been uh, my great pleasure uh, to be your instructor for this series. So uh, before we get started, is uh, there uh, uh, any questions uh, from any in the group here on the Zoom classroom? I always ask. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. Let me hit the right button. There we go. We're almost done. And we want you in this hobby to have a lot of fun. It is. It's fun getting together with other people and getting on the air, uh, making the contacts. But I want to postulate uh, uh, my theory about ham radio, that ham radio is more than just fun. Ham radio is an adventure. And when somebody says oh, adventure, what well, you think about this guy, you know, with the, the mountain climbing and, and et cetera, et cetera. The textbook definition of an adventure is an unusual and exciting, typically hazardous experience or activity. Well, how is this guy sitting at his radio console going on an adventure? Well, sitting at the radio console is the last step in the process. Uh, the process involves building that radio station, assembling things, putting up antennas, and uh, so you know, I, I postulate that ham radio is as much an adventure as mountain climbing because we have things that can be hazardous. Uh, and so that's what the whole purpose of this chapter tonight uh, is to talk about some of the hazards we might experience in amateur radio uh, and some of the things that we need to do to, to overcome them and to continue to operate safely. So that's what it's all about. Again, five sections tonight. We'll go through all five, take a five minute break, and then come back and do a practice test. And there are a bunch of di disjointed topics tonight, but they all have the common theme of safety. So let's start out by uh, just to remind you that when you're charging lead acid batteries, like you might find in your car, or sometimes used to, to power uh, amateur radio stations, Charging them creates hydrogen gas. Uh, it's a normal thing. It vents off uh, of, the, uh, of the battery. Hydrogen gas, can I say Hindenburg, uh, is flammable. Uh, and so you want to make sure that it's properly vented uh, when you're, you're charging uh, lead acid batteries. Lead acid batteries have a, another uh, potential hazard. Uh, so here we have long metal wrenches. And here we have a negative terminal and a positive terminal on the battery. 
a lead acid battery stores a lot of energy and the newer, more modern batteries, the lithium ion, etc., they have really high power densities. There's a lot of power in here. And if you drop a metal wrench across the terminals here, you'll get lots of uh, sparks, uh, uh, heating, uh, potential explosions. So you don't want to do that. You want to make sure that when you're using tools uh, around batteries with battery terminals, that you protect yourself, uh, cover the terminals, uh, just try to keep them away. Uh, also, if you're taking off the, the little clamps that are on the batteries, Note where your wrench is going to be going as you turn that wrench. Because if you turn the wrench and you're connected to the positive and you, it grounds out, again, you're going to have a really uh, fast release of energy. You don't want to do that. Shock hazards. Uh, power sources of 30 volts and above are potentially harmful, even lethal, both AC and DC current. Um, the, the primary uh, effect of electrical current is that it heats tissue, uh, it disrupts cell functions, and can cause mus muscular contractions that pre prevent you from even letting go. Uh, and so just be aware uh, of uh, shock hazards. And coming from my employment with the Voice of America, where I was with them for about 20 years, um, I was working with technicians who were working on very high-powered transmitters. I didn't worry about the newbies so much because the newbies were cautious and uh, you know, careful and you know, were aware of these issues that we're talking about. So for you old-timers, I'm talking to you right now, if you're, you're watching, you're the ones that have gotten away with a lot of bad habits. <laughs> so um, try not to do that in the future. It sets a bad example. <clears throat> Speaking of bad examples, I don't know, I don't think they do this anymore. But I was a Boy Scout years and years ago, and one of the interesting things that our Scout Masters sh showed us was this trick um, with some forks plugged into a hot dog and some alligator clip leads connected up to an AC cord that you'd plug into the wall. And it would heat the hot dog. You actually see uh, smoke coming out of here, steam, uh, and, and you'd hear the sizzling, and, and you'd have a, a cooked hot dog. Well, this sort of thing is largely frowned upon today. My point in showing you this is I don't want you to be the hot dog. Uh, so if you've got uh, shock hazards uh, in the area, just be careful. This was kind of interesting for me coming from an electronics background and then uh, having to work with electrical. Uh, some people do it the other way around, but the color codes in electronics and electrical are different and significantly different. So for a standard in the United States, 120 volt AC outlet, uh, we now have th three wires running to the outlets back in the day. Uh, used to only be two wires, but that was a long time ago. Uh, we have um, a hot wire, a neutral wire, which is where the current returns. This is where the current is sourced. This is where the current returns. And then a safety ground. Uh, and so the black wire uh, is the standard, is the hot, and that connects up to an outlet here. Notice this is the smaller, the more narrow uh, prong on the plug, that's the hot. That's the source of the electrical current. The white is the neutral. White connects over here to this other side. It's, it's the longer uh, or wider of the prongs. And then the safety ground is this third connection down here, and that's green. So we have hot, neutral, and safety, with hot being the black. So that's the standard uh, uh, national electrical code and local code. That's how things are supposed to be wired. I've been in houses where they've been miswired. So just make sure that you know, you're, you're conscious of that. In electronics, on the other hand, where I came from originally, black is the ground or the negative, and red is the source generally for uh, power supply voltages, uh, things like that. And, and the other colors are, are for signals or switching or things like that. So just be aware that if you're moving from electrical to electronics, the color code is different. 
So I had an experience with one of these here just recently. This is a ground fault circuit interrupter, uh, and they're used uh, in uh, residential and uh, commercial uh, installations. Uh, you're supposed to have them in basements, uh, in uh, garages, in kitchens, uh, areas where uh, you, you might have uh, water, things like that. And what happens here, again, you've got your hot on the, the narrower prong that's fed by the black wire. You've got the neutral, that's the, the wider of the prongs, that's the white, and you have the, the safety ground here, and they're all connected up to this GFCI. What the GFCI does, though, it actually measures current flow coming out of the source, coming from the black wire, and it says, okay, there's, there's that amount of current, so many milliamps or so many amps is flowing out of here, and does it equal what is flowing back in here? And as long as those are equal, it says, okay, everything is fine. But the minute it senses an inequality between the two, it trips the breaker. It trips right here uh, uh, in the circuit and removes power. And this is the kind of thing that might cause that to happen. Uh, if you've got your toaster plugged in here and it's uh, connected to a GFCI, and you've got, you know, power or current flowing from the, the black wire to the toaster and you provide an alternate circuit by touching the toaster in, a, in the wrong spot and grounding yourself out to uh, let's say uh, a uh, sink uh, or a faucet and what happens is there's more current coming from the outlet than there is going back and the GFCI will um, open the circuit and uh, save your life and they they really do a great job so I, i'm not bad mouthing gfcis however in amateur radio you need to be aware that gfcis in my own experience um, can depending on the manufacturer they can cause radio frequency interference most of them do not but some can, so that if you're listening to ver for very weak signals, especially on the high frequency bands, and you hear this noise, where's that noise coming from? Sometimes it can be the GFCI, and you only find that out by flipping off circuit breakers uh, in your pan and go, oh, the noise went away. It's in the bathroom. What's going on in the bathroom? So that's one thing. The other thing is that some GFCIs are sensitive to radio frequency energy. And so if you transmit, the GFCI will trip. And I've had that happen in an old house, in a bathroom that I had there. And here at my new house, uh, I actually uh, had a circuit installed and uh, the electrician put in a GFCI. And this is the circuit that's going to power my new radio station that uh, is under construction at the moment. And the first time I powered up my transmitter uh, to transmit into a dummy load, just to, for testing purposes, the GFCI tripped. Mm. Thankfully, it was not in an area that required a GFCI to be there, and so I have replaced it uh, with just a standard outlet, no longer having the problem. But um, the American Radio Relay League uh, has uh, this uh, URL, which is a resource uh, for ground fault circuit interrupters and arc fault circuit interrupters, a, a cousin of that, uh, which talks about some of the issues and problems that they've seen uh, with certain manufacturers. Um, and uh, just be aware of it. Uh, this is something that uh, you, you, you might run into. Grounding, we've talked about the, the green wire as a safety ground uh, on uh, standard outlets. Well, there are different kinds of grounding and they serve different purposes. And so here are three. There's electrical safety ground. So that's that green wire uh, that goes back to the, the panel, for example. There's lightning protection, grounding for lightning protection. And there's grounding in our ham shacks for radio frequency signal ground. Um, and they're not the same. Uh, and in fact, you know, I've had people ask me, well, can't I just, you know, use three wire plugs and outlets and that'll give me a ground and that'll be enough for radio frequencies? No, it's not. And we'll talk more about that here. It's certainly not for lightning protection. If you're going to be having, um, uh, I'll say, a lightning rod on, on top of your house or maybe an antenna on the top of your house, you want to provide 
some lightning protection. You want to uh, ground the mast or the tower and take it as direct as possible to the ground to an eight foot ground rod uh, driven uh, in. You want to make sure that the connections are as short and direct as possible. Now, the reason for this is that lightning is kind of like plasma energy. It has a very minute mass, but if it gets inertia going, if it's traveling down a wire and you give it a right angle, it'll actually jump off the wire and go wherever you are pointing it to. So uh, that might be you know, right where your equipment is. So keep connections short and direct as possible, avoid, avoiding sharp bends in the ground cable. And of course, when you're doing this, always follow your local electrical codes. Uh, that's what you need to do. Lightning striking a, a structure um, can cause all sorts of havoc, even with lightning protection like this. Um, even nearby lightning strikes. You know, this may be your house, this may be where your radios and equipment are, uh, but you've got a, a bunch of different places, uh, the, the telephone lines, uh, the power lines, uh, cable TV lines. Uh, at my old house, my DSL lines. Every time a lightning storm came through, I lost my DSL modem until I installed lightning arresters on the modem cables. And we'll talk more about that here in a second. So just be aware that the lightning uh, grounding can generally help. Lightning arresters and other means of protection are also uh, available. Well, Gary, I got to bring a, an antenna into my ham shack. Uh, that's got to come right into my equipment. How do I protect there? Again, lightning arresters. They make lightning arresters for coaxial cable. Uh, so here's uh, one from uh, uh, DX Engineering from Polyphaser. Uh, they have, in this case, uh, um, uh, SO239 uh, connectors on it. And they connect up generally to a ground panel like this, which is on the outside of the building where your ham shack is going to be located, on the outside wall, connected to a ground strap or even solid copper if you can afford it, and then connected to a ground rod or rods so that uh, should a surge come through the coaxial cable, the uh, Lightning arrestor will sense that immediately short out and take the energy to ground. That's the, uh, the way that the lightning arrestors work. So, very valuable. Grounding a tower. Uh, you want to give lightning a, a place to go or electrical energy from thunderstorms. The rule is that for each tower leg, this is a three-legged tower, one, two, three, you want to have an eight foot ground rod for each tower leg. They've gone beyond that. They've actually got four. And bonded together. So here we have this flat copper strap. And um, they may actually also have a ground ring that is buried going around the tower. As we said before, avoid sharp corner corners as short and direct as possible. So you're going to build your own equipment, right? <laughs> well, probably not. Most hams don't anymore. But if you ever intend to do it, absolutely, any AC-powered equipment, I would say even DC-powered equipment, should always be fused. And the fuse goes in the black uh, wire from coming from the AC uh, outlet. Remember, that's the hot wire, and that's where you want the fuse. You don't want the fuse in the neutral wire, because uh, that won't protect you. Uh, so uh, always, with AC-powered equipment, uh, for sure, uh, fuse or circuit breaker in the equipment. Well, Gary, I'm just going to work on my equipment, but I'm going to make sure I'm going to unplug it, so I'm going to be safe, right? Capacitors. Capacitors and equipment, especially uh, high power uh, linear amplifiers, things like that. Even unplugged, power supplies can be a hazard uh, or amplifiers can be a hazard because of energy that is stored in the capacitors. These are large oil-filled capacitors that if they were to be charged up to a DC voltage um, and then um, power removed, they could retain that voltage on the capacitors for a considerable period of time. All right, so now it's 
truth-telling time. Back in electronics class, uh, when I was first learning electronics, we had a beautiful facility. They had electrical components for us to, to you know, puzzle out and see how they worked. We had uh, oscilloscopes, we had meters, and we had high-voltage power supplies. Knowing this fact, we would take electrolytic capacitors, high-voltage electrolytic capacitors, connect them up to the high-voltage power supplies, and then we'd go to our buddy next door, here, catch! Okay, don't do that, but it illustrates a point that capacitors, even after the power is removed, can uh, contain a charge that can shock you. All right, here we go. We're ready for some questions. So go ahead and unmute and let's uh, see how we do. So which of the following is a safety hazard of a 12 volt storage battery? I'm going to spotlight this a little yeah. larger. There we go. There we go. I heard B, shorting the terminals can cause <laughs> burns, fire, or an explosion. That is correct. And what health hazard is presented by electrical current flowing through the body? Read carefully. Oh. Delta. Yeah, it may cause injury by heating tissue. It may disrupt the electrical functions of cells. It may cause involuntary uh, muscular contractions. So all of those choices. So in the United States, what circuit does black wire insulation indicate in a three wire 120 volt cable? Black is, Bravo. Black is the hot. And what is a good way to guard against electrical shock at your station? Delta. Delta. We didn't specifically talk about mechanical interlocks, but a lot of linear amplifiers, which use high voltage, like 3,000 volts, when you open the cabinet up, it will short out that power supply uh, so that uh, theoretically you're, you're not going to be shocked. So that's a mechanical interlock. Uh, connect all AC powered equipment to common safety ground, yes, and use three wire cords, yes, so all of those choices. Where should a lightning arrestor be installed in a coaxial feed line? Delta. Delta. Yes, on a grounded panel near where feed lines enter the building. And where should a fuse or circuit breaker be installed in a 120 volt AC powered circuit? Alpha. alpha. It is alpha in series with the hot conductor only. A fuse, if it's in series and it opens up, then it will uh, re uh, it'll stop the current flow. So what should be done to all external ground rods or earth connections? Charlie. Bond them together with heavy wire or conductive strap. And that's actually uh, part of the National Electrical Code for um, AC safety grounding, but it's also good practice for radio frequency grounding as well. So what hazard exists in a power supply immediately after turning it off? Here, catch. D. Charge, capacitors. stored, and filter capacitors. That's right. So which of the following is good practice when installing ground wires on a tower for lightning protection? Charlie. Mm. Ensure that connections are short and direct. So which of the following is true when installing grounding conductors used for lightning protection? Charlie? Charlie. Remember the plasma energy of a lightning strike, it could actually fly off of the wire if you have a 90 degree turn. So yeah, sharp bends should be avoided. Which of the following establishes grounding requirements for an amateur radio tower or antennas? Bravo. Bravo. Your local electrical codes always 
supersede everything. There is the National Electrical Code, which is a guidance uh, for this, but local electrical codes could be stricter. So, yeah, there's, they're the ones. All right, section 9.2, managing radio frequencies in your station. And I want to point out an interesting uh, impact or, or thing with the uh, radio frequency energy. For DC, and you have a wire, and this is a cross section of a wire. So for direct current, the entire area of the wire, the, the center part and the middle part and the outer part, all conduct current for DC. But as you go up in frequency, uh, up into the radio frequencies, something happens called skin effect. Uh, because of the radio frequency energy, it kind of repels, and so actually current only flows on the outside conductor, or the outside of the conductor. No radio frequency current flows through the middle, which is why in very high-powered transmitters, for example, they'll make the connections with hollow pipe. It doesn't matter because energy wouldn't be conducted there anyway. Um, and the whole thing to get radio frequency current to flow is to give it surface area. And so if you're going to be grounding your equipment, you want to make sure that that radio frequency energy, if it's supposed to be going to ground, gets there. And so flat copper strap is the best conductor for radio frequency grounding because of all of the surface area. Uh, it provides a very low impedance path for the radio frequency energy. So this is a, a coil of flat copper strap that you uh, would uh, take these pieces of tape off and, and then uncoil it. Uh, and you can use this, you can mount it against the wall, uh, you can uh, bend it uh, so that uh, it makes uh, turns around the corners. Uh, flat copper strap is the best conductor for radio frequency grounding. Moving on, slightly different to topic, feedback. So we've all been in the uh, gymnasium. Uh, I remember back to basketball games, uh, and you'd have the PA system, and you'd have the announcer with the microphone, and they're going into the mixer, and going into the amplifier, and going out to the crowd, and somehow the, the microphone gets turned, or the mixer again gets turned up, and you start getting feedback, a howling sound uh, in, in the auditorium. Okay, well, that's audio feedback. But there's something called radio frequencies feedback as well, where you have a microphone in your single sideband transmitter, uh, audio amplifier going into a balanced modulator, a sideband filter which uh, selects which sideband you want to pass, a power amplifier, and then out to your antenna. But that's not the end of the story. The energy coming off of the antenna can be received by the microphone or the microphone cable. And what happens is this radio frequency feedback path results in garbled or distorted speech. And when you're setting up your first uh, single sideband station, this is something you need to be aware of. And sometimes you'll hear people give you signal reports saying, hey, uh, your uh, audio signal sounds a, a bit fuzzy or sounds garbled. Uh, the likelihood is that you've got radio frequency feedback coming from your antenna back into your microphone cable. And I have a, a saying, ferrites are your friend. Uh, you can buy ferrite beads, this is a, a clamp type, we'll, we'll see another picture in a second, which you can put over cables, like mic cables. Uh, they're made of uh, different materials, so you can actually get toroid, toroidal uh, ferrites that you can wind cables through, and they will block radio frequency energy from traveling on the outside of the cable. Remember skin effect? It only travels on, on surfaces, and the outside shield uh, of a cable is a, where uh, radio frequency energy uh, can pass. This will block it. So ferrites are your friend. Uh, you can get the, these, these clamp types here, uh, and that will stop the radio frequency feedback and improve your audio quality immensely. Here we go again. More questions. So which of the following conductors is preferred for bonding, read grounding, at radio frequencies? Delta. Delta. Flat copper strap because of all of the surface area. 
And what is the symptom of RF feedback in a transmitter or transceiver? Charlie. Reports of garbled, distorted, or unintelligible voice transmissions. Wow, that was it for that section, but okay. Moving on to radio frequency interference. Aren't you getting sad? We're almost done. So radio frequency interference, there's two types. There's interference to others, or there's interference to yourself. And the first question to be answered, um, if somebody says, hey, I think your um, you know, radio transmitter is interfering with my TV, or my hi-fi, or my clock radio, or whatever it is, is to know, is your own equipment being interfered with? Uh, if your own equipment is working properly, uh, then there's a good chance that the problem might be at the receiver end. Um, and the causes of interference to other people could be transmitter harmonics. Uh, so you're transmitting on, uh, let's say, uh, 10 meters, uh, 28 megahertz. Well, the second harmonic would be two times that, or 56 megahertz. Uh, third harmonic would be three times uh, 28. So harmonics, if your transmitter is putting them out, might be a problem. You can solve that by adding low-pass filters to the output of your uh, transmitter. You'll see these at ham shacks uh, and uh, also at ham fests. In this case, this is 30 megahertz is the top frequency of this device. So uh, those uh, two times 28 megahertz harmonics would be blocked uh, by this. So less likelihood of causing interference to others. Spurious emissions are not harmonic related, but they're, they're extra <laughs> outputs from your transmitter on random frequencies, uh, sometimes caused by phase lock loop or phase noise uh, in your transmitter. So that's called spurious emissions. And the last is fundamental overload. That's the 28 megahertz that you're transmitting on the 10 meter band. That signal is just so strong that the receiver at the other end, the neighbor's receiver, maybe a cheap Chinese radio, I'm don't picking on anybody here, but inexpensive radios don't have any filtering on the front end, very little. And so um, they can't reject nearby signals on other frequencies. Uh, so that's fundamental overload. And there's not much more that you can do with that uh, other than replace the radio um, with something that is better. In some cases, filters can help though. Uh, does anybody still have a landline telephone? Well, they can be interfered with uh, by amateur radio transmitters. Uh, Morse code transmitters will sound like uh, clicks or pops on the phone line or um, if you're using single sideband, uh, it'll sound like a garbled or distorted speech. You can get these telephone uh, interference filters and add it to the neighbor's telephone, for example, uh, and that will eliminate uh, the uh, radio frequency interference from your transmitter. But you're bugging my TV. I can't get good TV reception. Well, filter it. Usually at the reception point is where you want to put these filters uh, to block the ham bands, but to allow TV frequencies through. But by and large, you're going to find that these aren't necessary. The thing that always causes radio frequency or TV interference are these things. F connectors. Bad F connectors, bad grounding, bad connections, corrosion. You pull this off and you see it's all green on the inside. Bad F connectors are the number one cause of interference problems. So just keep this in mind. If your neighbor says, hey, I'm being interfered with, um, we'll go over and say, can we check your antenna connections and, and check the your connectors and whatnot? And nine times out of 10, uh, you're gonna find this. So, okay, here's a, this is not strictly radio frequency interference, but if you're building a new ham station, like I am right now, and you get your antennas up uh, for the first time, here's a little uh, bit of advice from Gary, your online Elmer. Don't transmit for a week or two weeks, whatever, whatever reasonable. Just let the antenna go up and then wait 
if you've got a neighbor who's looking to cause trouble, they'll come in that first week and they'll say, hey, your transmitter is causing me trouble. And you go, hmm, that's interesting, because I haven't been transmitting at all. Okay. So interference to you, your neighbor's equipment, actually could interfere with your use of your amateur radio equipment. And if this happens, what you want to do is work with your neighbor to identify the offending device, politely inform your neighbor about the rules that prohibit the use of devices that cause interference. But before you do all that, check your station. Make sure it meets the standards of good amateur practice, uh, that it's uh, properly connected. You know, have a buddy come over, see if they can see anything. Uh, and it, when this is done, then you can go back. We are, in amateur radio, a licensed service. Uh, we have a, a license from, from the Federal Communications Commission. Garage door openers, baby monitors, things like that are unlicensed devices. And licensed stations always trump unlicensed. So if they're causing interference to a licensed radio service, whether it be you as an amateur radio operator or commercial broadcast operation or business band radio, or well, they have to solve the problem. It's not your problem to solve. Um, so, and even the FCC can get involved, uh, but j just be aware that you're part of a licensed service, which gives you some rights. If you're receiving interference from an FM broadcaster that's nearby with a strong uh, transmitter, for example, you can use something called band stop filters in the receive uh, section to, to block out, for example, the, the FM frequency band. Uh, if your interference is coming in from some other um, uh, source, for example, try using shielded wire. Shielded wire does two things. It prevents signal intrusion into the cable. It also prevents signal leakage from the cable. So uh, shielded wire, uh, even DC power, I went to um, uh, the extent of using shielded DC wiring uh, for uh, wiring uh, the, the power in my station, and I thought it reduced noise. So something to be considering. I mentioned the Part 15 devices. Part 15 are unlicensed radio frequency transmitters, garage door openers, uh, baby monitors. You have protection if one of these goes rogue and starts interfering in, in the ham bands. Okay, over to questions. Which of the following is a reason to use shielded wire? Charlie. To prevent coupling of unwanted signals to or from the wire. And what would cause a broadcast AM or FM radio to receive an amateur radio transmission unintelligently? Unintentionally. Unintentionally. <laughs> and unintelligently. Alpha. Yeah, that's fundamental overload. The, the receiver is just unable to reject strong signals that are nearby. So which of the following can cause radio frequency interference? Delta. Yep, all of those. Fundamental overload that we just discussed. Harmonic uh, transmissions from your, tr your transmitter or spurious emissions, all of those. So which of the following could you use to cure distorted audio caused by RF current on the shield of a microphone cable? Delta. What are your friend? Delta. Ferrites are your friend. A ferrite choke. So how can fundamental overload of a non-amateur radio, uh, radio or TV receiver by an amateur signal be reduced or eliminated? Alpha. This only works if the radio has an antenna input that you can get access to, and then you can block the amateur signal with a filter at the antenna input. So for a stereo receiver, for example, you could do that uh, with just a cheap Chinese radio, uh, probably not going to have that capability. So which of the following actions should you take if a neighbor tells you that your station's transmissions are interfering with their radio or TV reception? 
Alpha. Yeah, check your own equipment. Uh, if it's they say it's interfering with my TV, make sure that your station is functioning properly and that it does not cause interference to your own receivers when it's tuned to the same channel, etc. So which of the following can reduce overload of a VHF transceiver by a nearby commercial FM station? Delta. You can install an FM or band, FM band reject filter. Uh, that'll help you out there. It blocks the FM frequencies, but passes everything else. So what should you do if something in a neighbor's home is causing harmful interference to your amateur station? Delta. Delta is all of the choices, and that is correct. Work with your neighbor to identify the offending device. Politely inform your neighbor that FCC rules prohibit the use of devices that cause interference. And make sure your station meets standards of good amateur practice. All of those. So what should be the first step to resolve non-fiber optic cable TV interference caused by your amateur radio station? Delta. F connectors. Make sure that all TV feed line coaxial connectors are installed properly. Radio frequency exposure. So this was a big um, thing uh, that we had to deal with in the Voice of America because uh, we had large radio transmitting stations, our transmitters, uh, were 500,000 watts, or even uh, in the case of some medium wave stations, a million watts out of the transmitter. And then going to antenna systems that also had antenna gain. And this would irradiate the radio frequency energy around uh, the broadcast uh, antenna. And so we had to make sure that we kept people uh, and things away from the antennas. Uh, well, amateur radio operators have to do something similar, uh, but on a much, you know, smaller scale. I liken the heat, or the, the energy coming from an antenna is like the heat from a light bulb. And here I'm thinking the old incandescent light bulbs. Think of a 100 watt, you know, bulb that got really hot, okay? If you hold your hand out, you know, a, out in front of the light Nothing's going to happen. But as you move your hand closer and closer and closer to the light bulb, you might start to feel some heat. But if you put your hand right on the light bulb, ouch, you know, it's, it's going to be hot. So the same thing happens with amateur radio or radio frequency transmissions from an antenna. Uh, and so the FCC, along with OSHA and other agencies, have established maximum permissible exposure levels. Uh, and this is based on how the human body absorbs radio frequency energy. Uh, and so they have power density maximums that are allowed. Uh, so power density here in milliwatts per square centimeter, that's on the vertical axis. The horizontal axis here is frequency. So here's three megahertz, which is uh, the start of the 80 meter band, for example. And you see that up here, you can be exposed to 100 milliwatts per square me uh, centimeter. But as you go up in frequency, the maximum permissible exposure goes down, down to, in this case, on this line right here, one milliwatt per square centimeter. So we're, we're starting, that's 30 megahertz to 300 megahertz. Where have I heard that before? 30 megahertz to three, that's VHF. 30 megahertz to 300 megahertz. This is the VHF band. And VHF is the, the most problematic band for um, radio frequency exposure. Also notice there are two lines. There's a solid line up here and there's a dotted line down here. So the dotted line uh, is what they call um, uh, uncontrolled, and the solid line is controlled. Controlled means that people know 
that there's radio frequency energy in the area. So at VOA transmitting stations, uh, we had signs up, we would alert people of the hazards, uh, and so we could get away with exposure levels at this higher level. For random people walking in your neighborhood uh, who have no idea that there might be radio frequency energy, uh, it's the uncontrolled. So uh, you're allowed only to, uh, to transmit uh, this level, not this level. So how do you evaluate your station? How do you know if you're going to have a, a problem? Well, there are three ways that are accepted by the FCC. By calculations based on FCC Office of Engineering Technology Bulletin number 65, or by calculation based on computer modeling, or by measurement of field strength using calibrated equipment, uh, calibrated metering, and calibrated antennas. So those are the three ways that you can evaluate your station. And here's the, uh, uh, the FCC bulletin. Uh, here's the uh, URL link. You can go find it yourself. Uh, this is an active link when you get the PDF. It's 84 pages long, probably not the way you want to go. But inside this bulletin, they do have this chart. Oh, it looks similar, but this is the FCC's chart. It's the same thing. It's the same levels for controlled and uncontrolled. So in your book, you'll find this table, uh, and this is what they describe as power thresholds for RF exposure evaluation. And they say that as long as you operate on these frequency bands with these power levels, you don't need to do an evaluation. That has changed. You, you must, you, you have to be thinking about uh, and you must do an evaluation. Now, there's nothing that says the evaluation has to be written. There's nothing that says the evaluation has to be uh, in a certain format. What I'm saying is you have to think about it. You have to be thinking about what am I doing that might cause a hazard uh, to others. And so these are good guidelines. Uh, the power level and the frequency. Notice that uh, starting with 6 meters, uh, the, the power levels are the lowest, 50 watts. This is the VHF range. Uh, for 160 meter and 80 meter bands, you could, you could transmit 500 watts before without having to do an evaluation. But uh, for VHF, it's only 50 watts. You really need to do evaluations at all times. But what you can do is also use this uh, as a basis. Also, notice uh, that um, if you're transmitting, you're probably transmitting only half of the time, so that's a 50% duty cycle. Uh, if you're transmitting using single sideband, that modulation depth is not 100%. All of these factors, also the losses in your transmission line going up to your antenna, you, you subtract losses, add gains from the antenna as part of the evaluation. So what's a ham radio operator to do? Well. Online radio frequency calculators are what most hams use. So here is the URL for the American Radio Relay League's RF exposure calculator. Remember that one of the three methods that you can use is computer modeling. This is considered computer modeling. So uh, you can put in the details here about your station and get an idea uh, about what's going on. That's an evaluation. You've taken steps to determine whether you've got a problem or not. There's also an online calculator here that I like from the Lake Washington Ham Club, uh, which uh, the results should correspond to what the ARRL's site um, is like. These will help you uh, to determine whether you've got any issues. Now, we talked about that light bulb, and if you got up real close, you're going to get burned. Well, the same thing is true with amateur radio antennas. You do not want to be touching an antenna when it is transmitting because it will generate an RF burn. And I'm sorry for the grossness of this, but radio frequency burns, from my own experience, are the most painful and longest lasting kind of burns you can get. Uh, so uh, what you need to do is if you're going to have an antenna that could be accessible uh, when, it's being, when you're using it for transmitting, uh, that you need to limit access. 
putting up a fence, putting it up high, or whatever you need to do to keep people away from being able to grab onto it while you might be transmitting. Also, you need to be considering, you know, where is that antenna pointing? Is it pointing right into your neighbor's house? You may have to relocate it or just make sure that you don't point in the direction of other humans. So light from um, a light bulb, we said, you know, if you get up close to it and, and touch it, it's, it's going to burn you. Light is also the border line, the border between ionizing and non-ionizing radiation. Light has a frequency and above the frequency of light uh, is where you get into uh, radiation uh, from nuclear sources and things like that. Um, and so radio frequency radiation, the things that we do, it's below the frequency of light. And so it is called non-ionizing radiation. Radio is non-ionizing. It does not cause any genetic damage uh, to cells. And, but the same things that uh, apply at a nuclear reactor apply to us. Uh, the square law rule applies. So the strength falls at the square of the distance. So if you double the distance away from the antenna, then the strength is going to fall by a factor of four. So maybe you need to put that fence up around the antenna a little farther out to keep people further away. And distance, shielding, and time. These are the, the things that all impact um, radiation, uh, both radiation of ionizing and non-ionizing. But radio is non-ionizing. So this is a radio frequency radiation hazard sign. You can buy them on Amazon and elsewhere. Uh, this is radioactivity. Uh, this is if you've got you know, nuclear material. This is not what we are. This is what we are. And you can put these signs up might give your neighbors a thrill, <laughs> but it could turn your amateur radio station from being an uncontrolled station to a controlled station. You're alerting people uh, that uh, there, there's a hazard here and, and stay away from it. I mentioned uh, the, the time on the air. So if you're going to be only transmitting half of the time, uh, that's a part of the duty cycle. Some modes for example, single sideband and Morse code are 50% or less, even when you're transmitting. FM and radio teletype are 100% duty cycle modes, so when you're transmitting, you're using full power. So when you're doing your evaluation, uh, you need to consider your transmit versus the receive time and the duty cycle. If you're only transmitting half the time, then you can double the exposure. If you're only transmitting a quarter of the time, then you can... Uh, multiply the exposure uh, by four and, and still be valid. So making your site a controlled area can help as well uh, by limiting access, using fencing and signs, using directional antennas, make sure that you point them away from neighbors, or relocate antennas if necessary. All right, here's some questions. So what type of radiation are radio signals? Delta. Delta. I heard Stanley in there. Delta, indeed, non-ionizing radiation. And at which of the following frequencies does maximum permissible exposure have the lowest value? Bravo. Bravo. Remember I said VHF, that range between 30 and 300 megahertz, so 50 megahertz. And how does the allowable power density for RF safety change if the duty cycle changes from 100% to 50%? Bravo. Helpful. So if the power density uh, is uh, a limit is, is something, we'll, we'll say it's one. Um, if the duty cycle is reduced to 50%, then the power density can go up to two, or it increases by a factor of two. If you're going from 100% operation to 50% operation, then you can have a higher power density. This is the toughest question in this entire chapter. So what factors affect the RF exposure of people near an amateur station? 
delta. Yeah, all of these. The frequency and power level of the RF field, the distance from the antenna to a person, and the radiation pattern of the antenna. So why do exposure limits vary with frequency? Delta. Delta. The human oh, delta. body absorbs more RF energy at some frequencies than at others. And which of the following is an acceptable method to determine whether your station complies with FCC RF exposure regulations? Delta. There are three methods, and they're all listed there. Uh, the FCC OET Bulletin 65, computer modeling, or using calibrated equipment. All of these choices are correct. So what hazard is created by touching an antenna during a transmission? Bravo. You get an RF Bravo. burn, a Bravo. very painful RF burn. And which of the following actions can reduce exposure to RF radiation? Alpha. The only one that can reduce exposure in this case is alpha to relocate the antennas. Relocating the transmitter won't do any good. Increasing the duty cycle would only increase exposure. So, yeah. So, how can you make sure your station stays in compliance with RF safety regulations? Bravo. Bravo. You, you need to be continually reevaluating what's going on, and if something has been changed, you've got to be thinking about it. Um, well, how could this impact RF safety? So why is duty cycle one of the factors used to determine safe RF radiation exposure levels? Alpha. Yes, the average exposure um, is determined by the duty cycle as well as the, the emission level. So, yeah. So, what is the definition of duty cycle during the averaging time for RF exposure? Charlie? Charlie. The FCC is only concerned about when the transmitter is transmitting. So, it's the percentage of time that a transmitter is transmitting. How does RF radiation differ from our ionizing radiation, also known as radioactivity? Alpha. Yeah, RF radiation, non-ionizing radiation, does not have sufficient energy to cause chemical changes in cells and to damage DNA. So who is responsible for ensuring that no person is exposed to RF energy above the FCC limits? Bravo. That would be you, the station licensee. Section 9.5, Mechanical Safety. Are you sad yet? This is the last section in the book. So tower climbing, this is one of the hazards that we face in our adventure. Uh, and uh, so uh, if you're going to put an antenna up, you generally want to get it up as high as you can. Um, both for VHF, UHF, and uh, HF uh, it has an impact. Uh, the general rules are to use a hard hat and safety glasses at all times. When I was working in commercial broadcasting, this is something that you did not want to hear on the tower site. Somebody at, up top yelling, headache coming down. That means they dropped something. So always, you know, hard hat. Wear a safety harness if you're climbing the tower. Uh, in VOA, we always have the two-man rule. If you're going to be climbing or doing anything uh, electrical or whatever, there had to be two people there, always. And avoid electrical lines. Common sense. But there's nothing so uncommon as common sense. So in one of my uh, previous uh, professions, I, I used to work for a TV station up in Michigan. High Channel 5, WNEM-TV. Um, and I used to be on the engineering department, and one of the things that we used to be able to do uh, in the engineering department is for the newscasts, for the 6 and 11 newscast back then, is that we got to drive the live trucks. And we'd uh, take the live trucks out to various uh, newsworthy uh, locations, and we'd be met by a photographer and a, uh, a reporter, and uh, we'd beam back live 
uh, you know, news uh, feeds to the, the newscast. And it was kind of fun. But in the truck, uh, and this, by the way, this is um, an, a pneumatic mast. Uh, it's uh, run by air. There's a compressor in the back of the truck. Um, and uh, so you turn the compressor on, and this the air fills the mast, and it telescopes upward. It goes up and up and up and up and, you know, maybe 30 feet, 40 feet with a microwave antenna on the top that you'd point back to a microwave receiver at the station. Anyway, for the controls, for the compressor uh, and uh, the mast, we had a sign. And on that sign were these words. Look up, stupid. Because if you don't look up, this is what happens. Here's a live truck. Notice what's up above. They did not look up. So those are my words for you is to, to look up if you're going to be putting an antenna up, making sure that you know where electrical power lines are. Know how high your tower is. It's called the 10 foot rule. The safe distance from power lines equals the tower height plus 10 feet. If that tower height is if tower is going to fall over, you do not want it to land on electrical lines. So that's the ten foot rule. Also, this is a crank up tower. Um, it's not the best picture, but you can see that there are nested tower sections inside. Uh, it's a tilt over uh, crank up tower, so you can tilt it down or up, um, and then you use a hand crank or an electrical um, winch, whatever, to raise the tower up to tower height. Crank up towers must not be climbed until they're retracted to their lowest height or blocked mechanically. That's the rule. It's kind of like a guillotine. And if, a, if there's aviation cables on the inside, and if one of those breaks, it causes a problem. So crank up towers must not be climbed until retracted or blocked. Well, Gary, I want to put a tower up, but how the heck do I get the antenna up at the top? You can use something like this called a gin pole. I think it refers to a genie, not, not the alcohol. But um, you mount it to the side of the tower, uh, and it's got uh, a pulley arrangement up here, and you can lift tower sections up, swing them over, and plant them back down, and then secure them. And so towers can be raised vertically using just a gin pole. You can also use a crane or some other things, but uh, you'll find these in common use. If you're going to put a tower up, um, it can be a guide tower. You can see just barely here there are guy wires. Um, turnbuckles are used. Now, this is a turnbuckle. Uh, and to tighten and to set the guy tension. Uh, and so you can adjust it so it's tighter or looser. One problem is that in wind, these can back off on their own. So what you want to do is take a piece of wire and secure it in the turnbuckle such that it can't rotate. You use that piece of wire to prevent the turnbuckle from loosening. So just to keep that in mind. Is this a good idea? See the antenna? <laughs> See the power pole? I call this a stupid people trick. Because, no, it's not a good idea. High zap potential. Okay, our last questions. So what is required when climbing an antenna tower? Delta. Yep, all of those. Have sufficient training. Know what you're doing. Or have somebody there who can do it for you. Use appropriate tie-offs uh, to the uh, tower at all times. And always wear an approved climbing harness. You actually clamp the climbing harness to the tower uh, with two uh, lines. And always one is connected to the tower. So all of those choices. Under what circumstances is it safe to climb a tower without a helper? Delta. Yep, Delta. never. Two-man rule. So which of the following is an important safety precaution to observe when putting up an antenna tower? Charlie? Charlie. Look up, stupid. Yeah, look for and stay clear of any overhead electrical wires. And what is the purpose of a safety wire through a turnbuckle used to tension guy lines? 
Bravo. 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 Pre preventing loosening of the turnbuckle from vibration. And what is the minimum safe distance from a power line to allow when installing an antenna? Delta. It's the 10-foot rule. Yeah, enough so the, the antenna falls. No part can come closer than 10 feet to the power lines. And which of the following is an important safety rule to remember when using a crank-up tower? Charlie. This type of tower must not be climbed unless it is retracted or mechanical safety locking devices have been installed. And I'm just going to take a, a small... In earlier classes, the students are brilliant. And they say, you know, Gary, when I didn't really know what the right answer was, I realized that usually the longest answer is the right one. <laughs> Take a look at that. <laughs> I won't say it's 100% the case, but in case you get really befuddled, that might be something to learn. So which is a proper grounding method for a tower? Delta. Delta. Separate eight foot ground rods for each tower leg bonded to the tower and to each other. And why should you avoid attaching an antenna to a utility pole? Charlie. <laughs> high zap potential, the antenna could contact high voltage power lines. They used to have a, an answer a distractor here that said the power company would charge you extra. <laughs> no, not, not true. All right, that is the end of chapter nine. That is the end of the instructional portion of the class. You did great. So if you wouldn't mind hanging in for, we'll take a five minute break. You can get up and move around and stretch and whatnot. Uh, get a piece of paper and a pencil and uh, join us on the other side. Uh, we'll take a practice test together and I want to hear how you're doing. All right. So let's take five minutes and we'll be right back.
All right. Well, I'm so proud of you. Uh, we have uh, completed it through all of the uh, material in the book. And uh, so what we're going to do now is uh, together, we're going to take a, a practice test, a uh, 35-question test uh, generated by the American Radio Relay League uh, site. Uh, and um, we'll go ahead and get started on that. But for, f before we do, I just wanted to uh, mention that this is uh, from the ARRL as well, uh, that there are... Well, let's see, Turn my laser pointer on here. Um, there are 411 questions in the pool, uh, and each practice test or each test that uh, uh, you would take uh, before volunteer examiners is 35 questions. So to cover all of those questions uh, without repeats, if there are no repeats in the test, you'd have to take at least 12 practice tests. Well, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to take one uh, practice test together. And the plan is next week, if you'd like to come back, we will also take two more practice tests. We'll take a practice test, take a break, and then one more practice test. So that's three. Uh, but really, you need to take 12 in order to try to see all of the questions at least. Um, so you can use the American Radio Relay League site. I've sent you the URL, but I'll do it again in the uh, emails that I send out so you have that. You can use apps for your phone as long as they're using the current question pool. Whatever uh, you like to use that works for you, um, then uh, take the practice tests. Oh, here is the URL for the American Radio Relay League site. I forgot I had it in here. Um, so you can go there, sign up. It's free and take practice tests. And so let's go ahead and get started so we can get out of here early. Uh, take a blank sheet, if you would, and number it from 1 to 35. And what I'm going to have you do is uh, we'll have a question, uh, and uh, you can um, uh, see that, uh, the question, and then um, write down the A, B, C, D uh, correct answer on your answer sheet, and then we'll move on to the next question. Um, for those of you on uh, YouTube who are uh, watching along, uh, please play along uh, and see how you do. Uh, and uh, if you would, in the Zoom classroom, when you're done uh, with a question, just kind of raise your hand uh, so that I can see. Uh, normally in the classroom I can tell, but on Zoom it's a little difficult. So good luck. Let's get started. Oh, and by the way, there are no diagrams in this uh, practice test. That was just uh, random. I didn't choose it that way, but that's the way it came out. So, um, what is the definition of third-party communications? And if someone needs me to read the answers, I can do it. Just let me know. Oh, let me put you on spotlight so you can see it a little bit. Okay. Number two, which of the following battery chemistries is not rechargeable? Okay. Three, which of the following could you use to cure distorted audio caused by RF current on the shield of a microphone cable? Under what conditions is an amateur station authorized to transmit music using a phone emission? By the way, at the end, we can always go back and check any questions that you want to go back over. All right. Five, what describes the ability to store energy in an electric field? Six, what is the major function of an antenna tuner, antenna coupler? Okay. Seven, what is a way to enable quick access to a favorite frequency or channel on your transceiver? Okay. Eight, which is equal to 2,425 megahertz? OK. 
Okay. Nine, how are the transceiver audio input and output connected in a station configured to operate using FT8? All right, and 10. What term describes an amateur station that is transmitting and receiving on the same frequency? Eleven. What is the Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service, RACES? Okie doke. And 12. Which of the following measurements are made using a multimeter? All right. And 13. Are amateur station control operators ever permitted to operate outside the frequency privileges of their license class? All right, 14. Which of the following is a valid technician class call sign format? And 15. What antenna polarization is normally used for long distance CW and SSB contacts on the VHF and UHF bands? Sixteen, what is the approximate bandwidth of a typical single sideband voice signal? And seventeen, what is the name for the flow of electrons in an electric circuit? And 18, which of the following is an example of automatic control? And 19, what is the current through a 24 ohm resistor connected across 240 volts? N20, what is the Internet Radio Linking Project? N21, what frequency range is referred to as VHF? And 22, which of the following is accurately represented in electrical schematics? And 23, what is a transceiver? And 24, what is an ARQ transmission system? And 
and 25. Which frequency is in the 6 meter amateur band? And 26. In which direction does a half wave dipole antenna radiate the strongest signal? And 27, what is a relay? And 28, which of these components can be used as an electronic switch? And 29, who is responsible for ensuring that no person is exposed to RF energy above the FCC exposure limits. And 30. What mode of transmission is commonly used by amateur radio satellites? And 31. Which of the following causes failure of coaxial cables? And 32. What band is best suited for communicating via meteor scatter? And 33. Where should a lightning arrestor be installed in a coaxial feed line? And 34. Which of the following could be the reason you are unable to access a repeater whose output you can hear? And 35. What is the minimum safe distance from a power line to allow when installing an antenna? All right. Um, are there any that you'd like to go back and, and see again? Just unmute and let me know. Okay, I'm not seeing anybody. That's a first. All right, so the question is, how did we do? Let's find out. You'll grade your own paper. You don't have to share. Don't have to tell anybody, but let's, let's see. Question one, what is the definition of third-party communications? That's A, a message from a control operator to another amateur station control operator on behalf of another person. Two, which of the following battery chemistries is not rechargeable? That's A, carbon, zinc. Three, which of the following could you use to cure distorted audio caused by RF current on the shield of a microphone cable? That's C, a ferrite choke. Four, under what conditions is an amateur station authorized to transmit music using a phone emission? That's C, when incidental to an authorized retransmission of manned spacecraft communications. Five, what describes the ability to store energy in an electric field? That's D, capacitance. Six, what is the major function of an antenna tuner? B, it matches the antenna system impedance to the transceiver's output impedance. Seven, what is a way to enable quick access to a favorite frequency or channel on your transceiver? A, store it in a memory channel. Eight, which is equal to 2425 megahertz? That's the same as B, 2.425 gigahertz. Nine, 
How are tr the transceiver audio input and output connected to a station configured to operate using FT8? B, to the audio input and output of a computer running, this is the key, the WSJT-X software. That's what uh, runs FT8. And 10, what term describes an amateur station that is transmitting and receiving on the same frequency? That's C, simplex. 11, what is the radio amateur civil emergency service? All of those. It's a radio service using amateur frequencies. It's an emergency service using amateur operators. And it's a radio service using amateur stations. 11D. 12. Which of the following measurements are made using a multimeter? Voltage and resistance can be measured using a multimeter. That's D, 12D. 13. Are amateur station control operators ever permitted to operate outside the frequency privileges of their license class? A. Yes, but only in situations involving the immediate safety of human life or the protection of property. 14. Which of the following is a valid technician class call sign format? A 2 by 3 C. KF1XXX. The others are too short. Uh, that would be reserved for extra class. 15. What antenna polarization is normally used for long-distance CW and SSB contacts on the VHF and UHF bands? Horizontal polarization, 15D. 16. What is the approximate bandwidth of a typical single sideband voice signal? A, 3 kilohertz. 17. What is the name for the flow of electrons in an electric circuit? D. Current. 18. Which of the following is an example of automatic control? D. Repeater operation. 19. What is the current through a 24 ohm resistor connected across 240 volts? D. 10 amperes. 240 volts divided by 24. And what is the internet radio linking project? A, a technique to connect amateur radio systems such as repeaters via the internet using, here's the key, voice over internet protocol. 21, what frequency range is referred to as VHF? That's 30 to 300 megahertz, A, 21 a. And 22, which of the following is accurately represented in electrical schematics? The component connections. 23, what is a transceiver? B, is a device that combines a receiver and a transmitter. 24, what is an ARQ transmission system? A, it's an error correction method in which the receiving station detects errors and sends a request for retransmission. This is used for packet radio, uh, PACTOR, um, those sorts of things. 25. Which frequency is in the 6 meter amateur band? B, 52.525 megahertz. 26. In which direction does a half-wave dipole antenna radiate the strongest signal? D. Broadside to the antenna. 27. What is a relay? B. It's an electrically controlled switch. 28. Which of these components can be used as an electronic switch? A. A transistor. A transistor can be used as an amplifier or a switch. 28A. And 29, who is responsible for ensuring that no person is exposed to RF energy above the FCC exposure limits? You are the station licensee, A, 29A. And 30, what mode of transmission is commonly used by amateur radio satellites? 
all of those, FM, single side band, CW, and data, 30B. Which of the following causes failure of coaxial cables? It's always moisture, 31C. And what band is best suited for communicating via meteor scatter? C, 6 meters. 33, where should a lightning arrestor be installed in a coaxial feed line? C, on a grounded panel near where feed lines enter the building. And 34, which of the following could be the reason you are unable to access a repeater whose output you can hear? All of those could be improper transceiver offset, you're using the wrong CTCSS tone, or you're using the wrong DCS code. 34C. And last question, what is the minimum safe distance from a power line to allow when installing an antenna? 35D, enough so that if the antenna or tower falls, no part of it can come closer than 10 feet to the power line, the 10-foot rule. So, did you have 26 correct? No more than 9 wrong? Then you pass. And you are an amateur radio operator, if this was a real test, but this was a practice. So, um, I will close tonight with just letting you know there is a website uh, that I have. It's my website. Uh, it hasn't been updated in a while. Uh, but I'll just point out uh, that there is a donate button. Uh, the class is free, will always be free. Uh, but if you'd like to help uh, pay it forward and support the class uh, with a donation, we use any monies that are received uh, to buy new equipment or other things that we need uh, to produce the classes. And we're going to continue to produce the classes, God willing, uh, as long as it's fun and as long as uh, we can keep going. So we'll, we'll be doing that. Any questions before we close out tonight? Gary, I just want to say thank you. It's been a blast, sir. Absolutely. Great to have you, Jeremy. And uh, we will see any right. of you who want to come back. Thank you, Gary. Oh, yeah, you too, Frank. We'll see any of you want to come back next week for two more practice tests, and that'll be it. Fini for this year. But I want to thank you. It's been my great pleasure to be your instructor. Let me say 73. See you next week.